change the I want to change the way I've been talking about it just a little bit um, because as I was preparing for this next section um, I felt like the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart something a little bit different uh, before we get into the main part so I just want to share this with you it's still part of what we're looking at and I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 6 9 through 11 we prayed about it this morning in uh, in the uh, first communion service Oh, I need to get closer. Thank you. There we go. My fault. Sorry. I was trying not to worship the Lord too loudly this morning. That always, as I've gotten older, it really affects <clears throat> my voice. So is that okay now? There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. God bless the tech teams that, that serve us every week under great pressure. So, um, so Paul has been in Corinth, the city of Corinth, longer than any other city up to this point. He has been there about a year and a half. There's only one other city where Paul will stay a longer time, and that will be the city of Ephesus. And we're going to meet, we're going to get to Ephesus today, but we'll really get into it the next time. But up until now, a year and a half in this city of Corinth, a terrible city, really. Um, although those who enjoyed Corinthian life would not have said it was a terrible city. It was very free and easy and open and anything you wanted to find for pleasure, you could find it in the city of Corinth. It was rich because there was so much traffic going through it. Um, what they would do, the, the ships, uh, Corinth actually had three ports, so you can imagine it really made it a rich city. And the smaller boats especially would Port would stop on one side and then they built a road made of logs and they would roll the goods to the other side of the port and another ship would pick it up. Um, sometimes the bigger ships would go around but it was dangerous to travel it that way. And so Corinth enjoyed everything that came from the, the trade that passed through it and they indulged because of their wealth they were able to indulge in anything they wanted to we talked about this that it was a city of great immorality also because of that that there was a temple with 1,000 religious prostitutes that's hard for us to imagine isn't it I can't eat I can't imagine that um, and so Paul has been there for a year and a half he's been pouring his life into uh, into the into the people of this city and I want you to think for a minute about what the Corinthians were like. And here, this is from the letter that he writes to them. He writes this letter about a year or so after he's been in Corinth. And um, as he writes, you know where he's, he's in, I think he's in Rome when he writes this letter. And he says to them, he's reminding them, the Christians, he says, don't you realize don't that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God now this kind of scares us because how many of you sometimes do wrong raise your hands please oh well you're in trouble now <laughs> okay so what does this mean when Paul says this the the phrase and the you know I'm a back, back my background I'm an English teacher but and 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 I'm not a Greek scholar but I I'll, I do study and whatever but what this means is those who not just stumble and fall in this area but have these things as a lifestyle it's a lifestyle it's a choice it's an ongoing action in your life he says you won't inherit the kingdom of God don't fool yourselves so remember he's talking to Corinthians remember what the what the city is like remember the the uh, the the lifestyle the atmosphere of the city I think big cities have have certain characters don't you think so I, I do we we would say maybe this city is like this primarily this city is like this um, Hong Kong I think has a certain character as well all cities do um, and so he reminds this, these people, he says, don't fool yourselves, those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people, oh, we're getting a little bit, uh, or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. So he's speaking, this is what the people of Corinth were like, all of these things that we're reading. Um, and Paul had poured his life into these people for a year and a half and then comes the verse that that encourages each one of us because I want you for a minute to look back or maybe what you're going through presently and I want you to think of some of the things that you were 
and some of the things that you did before you became a child of God. If your past were to be displayed on this screen, how would you feel? Oh, not happy. I wouldn't want to be part of this. I wouldn't want you to know. I wouldn't want to, want, want to be part of this fellowship. But here's what Paul says, because you know, we're, a lot of us, we're in, we're in this as well. But then Paul says, and some of you were once like that. I love that verse, don't you? Some of you were, here, here's this terrible list. And then Paul says, and some of you were once like that. To me, this encourages me because, as I told you, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to mention this before we move on to other things. I know that in this church, some of us are struggling with certain sins or habits or bondages in our life right now. I know that. I know that some of you have talked with me, and just by, re, by, the, by the Holy Spirit, and just, it's the nature. This, we're, when everybody is here, we're about 200 people. For sure, some of us are struggling with things, and we don't want anybody to know about it. Some things are apparent, but a lot of other things, we just don't want anybody to know, I'm struggling with this in my life. Or some of us have this in our past and we still feel so guilty about it and so condemned about it or so dirty about it. You know, the, the, all of these things. But Paul says, you, some of you were that. You, not, you aren't that now, but you were that. And then he says, but you were cleansed. And here's the key for us, brothers and sisters. Here's the blessing for us. I hope you can, hope you can see it. He says, but you were cleansed. You were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right. So cleansed, made holy, made right with God. How? By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes? Okay, you've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so you've been made right with God, you've been cleansed, you've been made holy by calling on His name and by the Spirit of our God. And the Spirit of our God, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and He's working in you, and He's working in me, right? So the next time the enemy condemns you, the next time you struggle, you go back to this verse. And if Paul can say to a really a group of people that were a bunch of reprobates at one time, if he can say that to them and encourage them, we can be encouraged as well. And then at the beginning of that letter, he also says, I'm writing to God's church in Corinth, oh, that, that terrible city, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. How many of you have been called by God to be his own holy people? Raise your hands. Have you been called? Oh, I'm sorry. Some of you, you weren't called, but you decided to follow God anyhow. No, okay. He's called all of us to be his holy people. So if you've been called by God, you've been called to be holy. So in other words, to be like him. And then it's, and you say, oh, I'm having a hard time with that one. But then Paul writes, he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus. It was by means of Christ Jesus. And then he says, just as he did for all people everywhere. You see, you say, oh, but that's Corinth. And Paul gets rid of your argument and my argument by saying, he just as he did for all people everywhere. Paul didn't know that uh, 2,000 years later we'd be looking at this passage, but the Holy Spirit did, right? So God spoke with them and dealt with them for their time but he did it for us in our time, right? That's why it's never just a history, history lesson when we look at the Bible. So just as he did for all people everywhere who call, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ again? There you go. You're God's holy people. You are accepted in him. Amen? Amen. And when you struggle, you go back to these verses. And you've, you've probably never looked to these verses before for, for encouragement in your condemnation or in your guilt or in your struggle. But these are good, these are good places to be. Amen? And we say goodbye to... Ch Not yet. She's still here. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. By calling on the name of the Lord, by the Spirit of the God who comes to live in us. Amen. So that's an encouragement for you. Now... Let's go a little bit further. So Paul, remember last week we looked at it, uh, the Jews rose up in opposition. So by the way, take this, put it in your pocket, let it encourage you, okay? Now let's move on a little bit. Um, and then uh, remember last week, uh, opposition, the Jews rose up again. They took Paul in front of Gallio, who was the... Uh, 
uh, Gallio, who was the, uh, uh, the ruler over that area. I, I was talking with Andreas last week, and I didn't put it in my notes last week, but Gallio was the brother. Uh, only a few people care about this. He was the brother of Seneca, um, those of you that go back into Greek history and things like that. And so Gallio listens to the complaint, and he immediately says, ah, this is just a matter for Jews. And we think, well, what's that? But it was a wonderful, wonderful work that God did in that moment because what it meant, see, Gallio was very influential in the Greek and Roman world. And when Gallio said that, he was highly respected as a leader and as a judge. And when he said that, that meant for the next 10 years, Christianity would be open in the Roman Empire until the time of Nero the emperor, the crazy mad emperor 10 years later, Christianity would be open. And so it was, a, it was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. And it was also a reminder to Paul, uh, the words of the Lord, don't be afraid, keep on speaking. I have many people in this city. Amen? Amen. And so um, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, after Gallio. And then he said goodbye to the brothers and sisters, and he went to nearby Sancria. And you say, ha, huh, Sancria. That's wh why, why is that important? You know what's great about the Bible? We get this little passage, but there's everything else that's going on at the same time. Sancria was one of the ports of, of Corinth. It was about eight miles away. And you say, but why is that important? Because a little bit later, when he's writing to the Romans, do you know what he will say? He will say, Phoebe, a deacon from the church in Sancri. And you say, what? What? Paul started a church in Sancria? Yeah, he sure did. And Phoebe, one of the leaders, comes from that church. She's, she's a, uh, he uses the word deacon or leader or servant. He uses the same word for himself from that. And so when you're reading the Bible, always expand and look at other places too. So Phoebe was from there. But there are other things that uh, are going on as well. There, there are always a lot of things going on. Do you know what else was going on in Corinth while he was there, just as he's getting ready to leave? In Corinth, he wrote 1 Thessalonians, he wrote 2 Thessalonians, and he probably wrote Galatians while he was in Corinth. He also sent Silas back on a missionary trip, and he sent young Timothy. You say, what, what, what? you got to read the other parts of the Bible. Young Timothy, who was just a young man, he grew up in the Lord on this missionary journey with Paul, receiving instruction, becoming hardened in persecution, and Timothy is sent back probably to some of the areas where Paul and Silas couldn't go back. All of this takes place in Corinth. And so, we look at this, he says goodbye, he goes on, and then we come to today. So he, uh, he shaves his head, then he sets sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him, which is a little bit unusual. You say, he set sail for Syria. Uh, it's the same area of Syria today where all of the struggle, all of the fighting is, all of these things are going on, but that's where Paul's home church was, in Antioch of Syria. Now, there are people here this morning who don't count Lighthouse as their home church. So some of you would say, well, my home church is where? Well, Lighthouse is my home church. But some of you have a home church in Singapore. Um, some of you have a home church in maybe Huntsville, but maybe now Hong Kong is one of your home churches. Uh, poor Julie, her father gave up his church, so Lighthouse is her home, amen. And some of the rest of you, you may be part of a Chinese church at times as well. Um, but Paul is gonna go back to his home church and report, this is what happened on the missionary journey. And then he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. I'm wondering why he takes Priscilla and Aquila, aren't you? It's the end of his missionary journey. Why doesn't he leave Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth to keep on helping the Christians who are there, right? That seems like it would make sense to me, but we're gonna find out why he did that in just a minute. And so now we come today to this part, and we're going to look at there is more, or there's more. And the next two, the next two things we're gonna look at, um, this is what the Holy Spirit was leading me to as I was preparing, there is more. There's more. We're going to see two examples of more. And so I want to start by asking you a question. We're, we're into it already. That was a very long intro. I want to ask you where you are in your Christian life and in your Christian growth this morning. Yeah? 
Some of you have been, some of you are baby Christians. Please don't be offended. That's just, you were born as a Christian not so long ago, right? So you're at this level. Some of you have been Christians a long, long time. Where are you in your Christian life? How long have you been walking with the Lord? But more than that, how are you growing in the Lord? Because you know what I have found? What I have found is this. For some of us who have been Christians for a while, I don't want to offend anybody, but I count myself in this group. Some of us, when we've been Christians for a while, and when we know a lot, we start to settle down, don't we? How many of you have ever settled down? That's right. I've settled down before. All of us have settled down. And what I want to say to you this morning is this. If we've been in the same place for a while in our Christian walk, in our Christian life, what I want to say is this, we're not in the same place. We're losing some of what we had in Christ. Because you can't stay in the same place. You either make progress or you start to move back. That they're really, you can't just say, well, I'm in a good place. Let me stay here. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. You know, as, as they say, I think it's in, it's in a, sports, a, a sports analogy, exercise this and that, use it or lose it, right? Have you heard that before? Use it or lose it. Um, and that's kind of what, that, I, I think that works for our Christian lives as well. If we're not learning and then responding, we're losing ground. If we have been growing in knowledge, and I think at Lighthouse we do our best to present the true balanced Word of God. We receive it, but if it stays here and it doesn't get mixed with faith and obedience in our lives, then we're losing ground. We're losing ground. And so today we're going to see some things here in Hong Kong, August 4th, 2019. We're going to look at two examples that I believe the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to include. So here we are. Take a quick look. You know how I love maps. So let's see what comes next. When they reached Ephesus, uh, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue. He engaged in discussion with the Jews. And though they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. And he, but he said goodbye, and he said, I'll come back to you again if God wills. And then he set sail from Ephesus. Okay, so he was at Corinth, they sailed to Ephesus. Was Ephesus their goal? No, but that was, it was, they were traveling by ship, so this was one of the big ports. Just as Corinth was the most important city of this region, Ephesus was the most important city of this region. Next week we'll look at it, but you know what? When Paul began his missionary journey, he wanted to go to Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit said, Pushing. The Holy Spirit said, no, no. And now here he is, and this time there's an open door because as he speaks in the synagogue, the Jews in the synagogue say, hey, stay longer. So their hearts are open as he, whoops, as he, wow, that was good, as he shares with them, as he, um, as he teaches, and they say, please stay, stay longer. And you know what Paul says? No. I've got to keep on going. God, brothers and sisters, guides us every step of the way. He really does. If you will set forth your desire and your plans before Him and say, God, I'm going to go where you tell me to go. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to stop when you say stop. I'm going to go slow when you go, say go slow. And when you say go, I'm going to go. And that's what Paul did. What a great way for us to, to go as well when we look at this example from Paul. So he's in Ephesus, and he says, Nope, if the Lord wills, I'll come back. But then he is going to go on. Who does he leave in Ephesus? He left them there. Who's them? Who's them? Come on. Who? Priscilla and Aquila. Ah, okay. Do you think Paul knew in Corinth, when we get to Ephesus, I'm going to leave them there? No. Sometimes God leads us and directs us. Sometimes things seem like coincidence, but God has a plan, right? So they get to Ephesus, and then it becomes clear. Priscilla and Aquila are going to stay in this city, this great city of Ephesus. A church begins there. Priscilla and Aquila stay there. 
and they begin to nurture the church. Now look with me for just a second. Are any of you pastors in this group? <laughs> okay, I am. Few else of others of you would raise your hands, but what I want you to see is this. Paul leaves Ephesus. It's a brand new stirring of a church. It may be just a little shoot and a sprout and one or two leaves, but Paul leaves not pastors, not preachers. He leaves business people who are sold out to God in Ephesus to nurture this church and to share and to teach the Word of God. Business people. So don't excuse yourself. Well, I can't cause I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not called to stand in a pulpit. Few people are, brothers and sisters, really, when you look at the percentages, few people are. The vast majority and most of God's work is done through lay people. It really is. It's done through, it's done through people just like you. That's what Priscilla and Aquila are. And so they stay there. And now this sets up what happens. Um, and this, let's see what happens next. Then he set sail from Ephesus. So Paul goes on back. Paul's going to go back to Antioch. He's going to go to Jerusalem. Now set aside, set aside Paul for just a minute. Let's see. Let's, let's pay attention to some other people. Meanwhile, I love that word. Okay. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus. Paul was there. He starts a church. He leaves. In the meantime, this really great speaker, better than Paul, better than Paul, if you read other things, you, you'll, we'll, we can agree on that. He arrives in Ephesus. He arrives from Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria was a wonderful city. Maybe almost a million Jews lived there. It had the largest library in the world. Perhaps up to 4,000 scrolls were in the city of Alexandria, the great library of Alexandria. Um, if you've seen some television, uh, if you've seen some movies and things like that, part of the Library of Alexandria, I think it's in National Treasure or something like that, one of, the, one of those movies, I think. Um, uh, pure fiction, by the way, but there was a great library in Alexandria. So Apollos comes from this. Um, those of you that are familiar with how, how we got the Bible and how, how the Bible was translated, it was in Alexandria that the Hebrew Jews took the Hebrew Old Testament translated it into Greek so it could be read by many and that was called the Septuagint. Those of you that know something, that was in Alexandria. So his pedigree is great. Look with me. His pedigree is great. He's an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well. That means he was very accurate with them. He didn't, you know, sometimes people know scriptures well but they twist them, right? Apollos does not twist them. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an, with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. Do you know what this word means? This word, enthusiastic here, means boiling in spirit. Have you ever met somebody who's boiling in spirit? Just as a general whatever? All of us have, right? They're, they're, we like to be around them. They, they pep us up. They encourage us as well. Here comes Apollos. He's boiling in spirit. He knows he's really intelligent. He's a great speaker, better than Paul, as we find out later, because even the Corinthians later say, oh, Paul, he's unimpressive in his speech, but Apollos now. And so this is his background. And he comes, comes to Ephesus, to this church. Woohoo! What a blessing, right? Let's go a little bit further. However, he knew only about John's baptism. Mm. What does that mean? He knew only about John's baptism. Well, if we go a little bit further, let me make sure did I include, I didn't include that in my notes, I don't think. Hang on. Nope, I didn't. Okay, so let's go back to that. He knew only about John's baptism. What was John's baptism from Luke? Okay, come on. We know the scripture. What was John's baptism? Water. Remember what John said? Thank you, Beth. You're right. John said, I baptize with water, but there's someone coming who's greater than me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. When he comes, he will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and... Fire! 
Fire, that's Luke 3.16. 3, yes, Luke 3.16. When Jesus comes, when this one comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So was Apollos a Christian? Yes. Did he love God? Yes. Did he know about Jesus? Yes. Did he handle scripture accurately? Was he enthusiastic and full of feeling as he preached the word of God in the, in the synagogue? All of these things, yes. But there are Aquila and Priscilla, and they're listening to this man, wonderful in every way, talented in every way, gifted and equipped in every way, but something was missing. Something was missing. There was more. There was more. And so what do Priscilla and Aquila do? Now, brothers and sisters, here comes your part and my part. When they heard him preaching, how did they know that he only understood the baptism of John? Did he say it? We don't know. Or could they sense it from their spirits? Have you ever been around a Christian that they love the Lord, they're good, they're whatever, but there's something missing? And you realize they haven't found more yet. That's right, all of us have. And so what do they do? They hear him preaching boldly, and then you know what they do? If we look at that, they took him into their home. They took him into their home. One Sunday, uh, a few years ago, some of you were here at the time, um, I was preaching. I think Pastor Ine was gone that Sunday, but some of you will remember. And one of the, one of the sisters, she's no longer here, Joy McGuion, who was here before, brought her employer to church that Sunday. Now, I'm not telling tales on anybody, but I'm sorry to tell you, I, when he walked in the door, my spirit inside went, <gasps> It, there was something that was so wrong and so off. And he was very friendly. He joined the prayer time and whatever. And that Sunday morning, I was preaching. And in the middle of preaching, he raised his hand. But don't you think, whatever, as I was preaching, and Steve, big Steve, bless his heart, got up and went over to him and tapped him on the shoulder. And then I went a little bit further and he spoke out again. And I, I think I said, let's keep on going. And then after the service, he came right up to me and he said, don't you think whatever. Um, well, first of all, the Holy Spirit had told me his spirit wasn't right. But to do it that way also was totally inappropriate. But if we look at uh, Priscilla and Aquila, brothers and sisters, if you have something to share with somebody or to add to somebody or the Spirit prompts you, may I say to you, here's a great example, isn't it? Do they put them on the spot? No. They do it privately, don't they? They do it discreetly. Did they have something to share and to say? They did. But honestly, brothers and sisters, when we, when we are confrontational in this, it almost never does anything good. And so Priscilla and Aquila have to be brave enough and bold enough to, and sensitive enough to go to the great speaker Apollos. After all, they are lay people, right? Apollos, he be the man. He's the preacher. He's the whatever. So Priscilla and Aquila have to be sensitive and go to him. And do you know what most Bible teachers also say here? They say that probably Priscilla in spiritual matters was the leader or was the more gifted one. And so probably, although husband and wife worked together, it's probable that there was more teaching from Priscilla. And in the world at that time, that would have been very inappropriate culturally. It would have been totally unaccepted. And so they do it carefully. And so as we walk with the Lord, we pay attention to culture, don't we? We do. We, we have to pay attention to culture. We've got to pay attention to these things. So they bring him into their home. And what does it say? They took him into their home and explained the way of God even more accurately. Now you say, yes, but Pastor Jennifer, this does not say what they explained to him or what happened. God doesn't say it, but God gives us brains, doesn't he? He gives us brains. And it says he only knew about John's baptism. What baptism do they share with him? The baptism of Jesus. And what's the baptism of Jesus? 
the Holy Spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit baptism. And so, what do we read next? We then read, Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus said, yeah, go. Now, you know what? Don't read this the wrong way. Have you ever encouraged somebody to go because you're tired of them and you want them to leave? Yeah, 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 I think you should go, yes. Oh, you'll be, you need to go there. You need to go there. It's because you want to get them out of your face, don't you? <laughs> We've done that before, haven't we? Yes, we have. Now, that's not what happens here. They really, Apollos is a blessing. And so they encourage him. You've blessed us in Ephesus, and then he wants to go to Achaia. Wait a minute. What's Achaia? Achaia is Corinth. Isn't this unusual? Think about how God arranges things. This is the church in Corinth that Paul has started and fed, and now Apollos feels like, I want to go to Corinth, too. Hey, how can Apollos be a blessing in Corinth? They've already had Pastor Paul. How many of you would want somebody else after you've had Pastor Paul? I wouldn't want somebody else after Pastor Paul. I want Pastor Paul. I'd be always talking about, oh, Pastor Paul. Oh, Pastor Paul. Oh, nobody could preach like Pastor Paul. Learn a lesson, brothers and sisters, because God brings many people into our lives and out of our lives he goes, and what does it say? He proved to be of great benefit to those who by God's grace believed. Do you know what that means, brothers and sisters? He went after more. He really did. How could he be a blessing where Paul had been pastor? Because he received the teaching and the instruction of Aquila and Priscilla into his life he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's very, very clear. And because of that, he could be a blessing. When he received more for himself, he was able to give more of himself, of the Lord, to others. We can only give to others. We can only bless others. We can only lead others to the point where we ourselves have been, to the point where we ourselves have grown. And so my challenge to each one of us this morning is, how far along are you in God? Or do you have it up here, or is it mixed with faith in your heart, and it's your, there's obedience in your life? Because if you and I try to tell others from up here, oh my goodness, doesn't that come off badly? It really does, because then we're telling other people, and we ourselves aren't living it. That, that's, a, that's a great way to get somebody to uh, slam the door in your face, or, to, or for Christians really to turn you off because it, it, it comes across very hard. But Apollos goes there, and he's a blessing. In fact, look at this. He is able to be more successful than Paul was in this area. Yeah? Remember? They rejected Paul very quickly. But God is using Apollos in that area. God's using Apollos. Now, let me stop just a minute and look at that, and then we'll go to one more example this morning very, very quickly. So God uses Priscilla and Aquila to teach Apollos. Has God ever tried to use somebody to teach you or to grow you or to sort of challenge you to grow up? How did you feel about it when it came to you? I don't know about you, but may I tell you about me? When it's somebody I respect, when it's somebody I admire, when it's somebody I look up to, I can usually receive correction quite well. You know, that person. You know, if Pastor, if Pastor Paul speaks to me, yes, 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 I receive it, I receive it, I receive it. But you know what, brothers and sisters? Me, and I suspect you, because we're all people, like to pick and choose the ones we receive from, don't we? Husbands and wives, is it not true, you know, I'm single, but I've heard, is it not true that you are willing to receive correction, but not from your spouse? Is that true or not true? You don't... I'm looking back there. I'm looking there. Others, other people can tell me, but I don't want my spouse to tell me, or my boyfriend or my girlfriend, or the Christian that rubs me the wrong way. I don't like that. Or a person that I think is sort of lower spiritually than I am. I know more. I've been a Christian much longer. Who are, who are they to think they have something to tell me? Brothers and sisters, that's pride. That's pride. 
And if we have pride about this, we close the door to growth. If we have pride about this, we close the door to more in our lives. We really do. Listen, God chooses those that He speaks through into our lives. God chooses. We don't choose. We don't choose. God can use a donkey, right? He can use a donkey. And so if God brings a donkey into your life <laughs> to speak to you, you know what I mean. Just say, yes, I want more. I want more. And when we are humble about it, God can help us to keep going on in Him. We'll receive more. I think Apollos, I, I think, I mean, Apollos, wow, outside of Paul, I'd say Apollos, Apollos is right up there, right? He's number two. You know, a lot of people believe that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. Some say, no, no, Paul was, Paul was the one who wrote, but many people believe it was Apollos. Uh, some people believe maybe that Priscilla, of Priscilla and Aquila, wrote, uh, wrote that or others as well. But he may have written Hebrews, we don't know. But Apollos had to be, hum the great Apollos had to be humble enough to say, yes, I need more. I've got a lack in this area. He wasn't wrong. He wasn't inaccurate. He was just incomplete. May I say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, each one of us here, each one of us, so I'm not pointing fingers, I include myself, each one of us is incomplete in some area. We are. We are, aren't we? God, help us to keep a humble spirit and to open our eyes and to receive and to go after more, not just up here, but then mix it in our hearts with faith and obedience, and obedience. And when we do, we will grow. When we do, we will be blessed. And when we do, we will be a blessing. So if we've been stuck where we are, if we've been stuck where we are, then we're not maintaining ground. We're losing ground. And there's more in Christ for every one of us. Because Paul, because Apollos was willing to receive from Priscilla and Aquila, Jews, other Jews, business people, business people, lay people, not trained in the synagogue. He received the blessing of the Lord. We want that too, don't we? Brothers and sisters, may we open our hearts to all of the people and all of the ways God speaks to us. It may be through a spouse. It may, sorry, husbands and wives, it, uh, it usually is through a spouse if you're married. It may be through another Bible teacher. It may often be through another Christian who really kind of rubs us the wrong way. That's pretty common. It, it really is, because that tests our humility and, and, and shows our pride, doesn't it? It really does. But there is more for us in the Lord. And because I kept you longer last week, I'm not going to keep you longer this week. So this is your homework. You're responsible to read Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7 because y'all are all pretty smart because when you read that you'll find something else Apollos leaves Ephesus goes to Corinth guess what Paul shows up at Ephesus and he meets some people who also need more so your response and it's the same sort of thing again your responsibility we'll get to it either Pastor Renee may want to speak next week. We'll see. But you read on your own um, Acts 19, 1 through 7, and they go after more as well. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's close in prayer this morning. And would you very simply, I invite you, yeah, stand. I, I, I liked that. Panina stood. You've been sitting, seated. Amen. Would you join me in, in asking God for more, whatever 